Hi, this is Tim Pack, back with part three of four in our series on ISCO injection projects. Here we're going to talk about contact and persistence. We've already discussed a little bit about selection and loading, delivery and distribution. So here we're going to talk about contact and persistence in the subsurface. So as you're injecting material into the ground or emplacing material into the ground, you have three major processes that are affecting the distribution of that material. You have the initial emplacement, which is the plug flow displacement during injection. You have the post-placement advection or groundwater flow components where the injectate moves with Darcy and flux with relaxing pressure, or in other words, it moves with the groundwater flow at a site. And you have dispersion, fixed law, where you have distribution by concentration gradient spreading. Most typically important at low velocity sites, limited permeability sites. However, dispersion also plays a role in a site. So if we look at these, you have an initial emplacement, which is typically point type sources where you're trying to emplace either a small amount of material as shown on the upper left with the points or a larger volume of material and get overlapping radii as in a barrier type approach. The one main component here to keep in mind is typically there's a fixed ROI that you've calculated from an initial program or you've assumed it going forward. So you've placed typically an offset grid pattern on the subsurface and you've injected material in a point series. Depth specific emplacement has to do with your targeting vertical intervals or you have strata that's vertically inhomogeneous where you're trying to inject in select strata. So you're targeting your depth injection relative to your concentrations. And finally you have sequence or spatial temporal where you're doing multiple events, periodic dosing, for a number of purposes at a site. Maybe you don't have access except once a month. Maybe there's too much volume to apply, whatever. Uh, you're doing it temporally different over time. And in combination of these three methods, what we're looking at is oxidant spreading post-injection both longitudinal lateral forward and backward where your points that you initially emplaced material becomes a homogeneous coverage overlapping circular radii. Here you have to ask yourself, is this really what we are achieving in the subsurface? And we'll talk more about that in a later stage of presentation here. One factor to keep in mind is permeability channeling, that is the preferential flow of injected fluids in areas of higher K relative to low K. It is well known and well documented that when you inject in, as shown here, a very long screen interval, the injectate will flow in areas of high K and not so much in areas of lower K. In other words, you'll get distribution based upon conductivity of the strata. That is important and part of the reason why many times we inject with much shorter screened intervals to target the placement of that material. So you need to consider the effects of permeability channeling, especially if you're using existing wells out of site. They may or may not be constructed in a way that is helpful to provide additional distribution for you. Finally, Another topic to consider here is persistence or the oxidant stability over time, which varies by oxidant. We talked a little previously about auto decomposition and reaction over time, the reactive tracer components of it, transport, which we introduced just previously, but the oxidant concentration will both change over time and decrease over time as a function of the decomposition of that material. And the way in which you measure that over time is you're measuring oxidant concentration over time in a series of locations. You're looking at that oxidant stability. You're looking at the migration or spreading of the material. You're looking at site variability. Is this site behaving the way I expect or is it not? And provide an opportunity for going forward. You're also looking at rebound. If you inject an oxidant and it's fully consumed and your contaminant is still desorbing from soil and there's no oxidant there to treat it, you can get an increase in concentrations even in the presence of trace amounts of available oxidant. 
So we've shown on the bottom here, based upon oxidant, the oxidant in and of itself is persistent for a limited period of time. Auto decomposition will consume all oxidants. Peroxide, very quickly, days to weeks, maybe months, peroxide will go away. Persulfate has the advantage of, has a longer stability time in the subsurface, months to years. So you can add persulfate and as long as it's present and activated in the subsurface, it can provide treatment for a longer period of time. Permanganate essentially has no decomposition and is stable until it reacts with something. So you can end up with permanganate in groundwater for an extended period of time. Something to consider as you're designing your program. Talk briefly here about a couple oxidant misconceptions. Uh, these have been presented previously, but I wanted to reiterate them because they do come up over and over again. Oxidants are reacting with the subsurface. That is, they're creating end products different by oxidant. You're taking a contaminant, typically you're creating another dissolved species, ionic, or you're creating a uh, precipitate in the subsurface, sulfate in the case of uh, persulfates, manganese dioxide in the case of permanganates. Point here is by adding oxidants, you do not clog formations. Even at really high loadings of oxidants, there is less than 10% void infilling or less than 10% of available pore volume, even at ultra high loadings, is, in, is completed as site. So you will not clog a formation. If you're injecting <clears throat> and the injection stops, in other words, you're no longer injecting material in the ground, that's often been attributed to, oh, well, you've clogged the formation. Well, typically not. There's typically something else going on, and that is something you want to take a look at. Secondly, oxidation does not sterilize the formation. The biota does recover quickly and fully, although the population that recovers may be different in part from what was there previously something to take a look at, especially if you're using treatment trains, such as you're using a biological method, uh, inductive, reductive dechlorination after ISCO, you may need to do some bioaugmentation following ISCO to ensure you have the proper biota at the proper concentrations. Secondly, delivery remains critical to ISCO success. If you can't deliver and distribute the material on the subsurface, you will not have an effective ISCO program. Second, oxidant can persist in the presence of contaminant. Uh, the same type of thing present when sampling groundwater in wells. You can have areas of high concentration and an area of low concentration. So if you're using groundwater and monitoring wells to measure the success of your ISCO program, be advised you can have contaminant present and oxidant present and initially think, well, that can't be, it should react. It can vertically, especially in long screen intervals. Finally, excess oxidizer can lead to false negatives. So if you inject an oxidant and you go ahead and sample the site with oxidant present in the subsurface, lo and behold, there's no contaminant present, we declare victory. Well. Typically, you need to look at the presence of contamination when there is no oxidizer present in order to evaluate the relative success of the method. If you send a sample containing excess oxidizer to the laboratory, you may get a false negative, and you also can damage the lab equipment. And there are procedures associated with sample preservation at ISCO sites where you're able to quench or react the excess oxidizer before sending it into the lab. Happy to help in those areas, but yeah. from an ISCO point of view, Terra systems were available to help. Our focus is on treatment train type technologies, the use of ISCO and the complementary technologies, either spatially or temporally at particular sites, and we're happy to help in whatever way you would like for a particular site. We can assist in design and formulations, distribution, support, and assistance in the field if needed. So please reach out to us. We've shown our complement of technical folks here on the slide. Please reach out to any one of us and we're happy to assist. Thanks so much for listening. One more session.